has written and illustrated a whole bunch of graphic novels, including one called Two Generals, which is a story about his grandfather. So he's going to talk to you about today about his books and about how he does them and how he came up comes up with the ideas. Okay? So here we go. Here we go. So we all know what a graphic novel is, right? It's like a comic book except, well, yeah, comic books have pictures too, but yeah. with speech, well, those are all things that comic books have, but a graphic novel is a comic book that is, okay, it's longer. Okay. The word novel sort of implies something that's, you know, more than about 100 pages or so. So, yeah, something with a square spine, you know, sold in bookstores, not just comic shops or the magazine rack. It's, it's you know, it's not the monthly adventure of, you know, underpants man. It's the, uh, you know, it's a complete thing, you know, with beginning, middle, and end, and, you know, some kind of heft page count to it. So I've done a number of books. Um, some of the stuff I do, and I'm really pleased with how many of my books are, are here in the library. This is very cool. Um, so I do some stuff like this, which is a little more for kids. Maybe the grade sevens in here, maybe this is a little more your speed. But just kind of fun adventure stuff for kids. The series I do called the Three Thieves series. Uh, the book I'm going to be talking about today is called Two Generals. It's one other one I picked up here. Um, it was written for adults. It might be a little over the head of some of, or maybe the grade sevens, but um, I've been asked to talk about it a lot at schools and libraries. They're actually adding it to the curriculum in some high schools back home in Ontario in grade nine and ten uh, in English history and art, uh, which is very cool. Uh, and like I said, I've been invited, you know, all over the country to come around and talk about this book, especially around this time of year uh, with Remembrance Day coming about two and a half weeks until Remembrance Day. Uh, because, uh, as Laurel mentioned, it is, it's my first nonfiction book I've ever done. It is a true story. It's based on my grandfather's experiences in the Second World War. Um, so with a lot, you know, of the I mean, we've all, you know, been through Remembrance Days in years past, and, you know, we're used to having Second World War veterans around, and, but we're losing a lot of those veterans at a pretty alarming rate. I actually read a statistic a year or two ago that said we're losing 80% of World War II veterans every year. So they're not going to be with us all that much longer. And the ones that are left are getting pretty old and sometimes, you know, a little too old to, you know, come and, and speak the way they always used to, that I certainly remember when I was a kid. Um, but it's still important that we remember their stories, right, even after they're gone, and uh, to remember them on Remembrance Day and, and at other times too. And uh, so that's one of the reasons why I wrote this book. It's one of the reasons why I like to come around and talk to students like yourselves, share my grandfather's story, and share a little bit of the story of how the book uh, came together, which I hope you will find interesting. So, I'm going to talk for about 40 minutes. Okay, I've got my little fancy PowerPoint presentation here. Uh, then I'm going to want some questions. Okay, we're going to fill in the rest of the time with questions. So everyone, try to think of some good questions, will you? Because it's, there's nothing worse than when you finish the thing and there's no questions. So while I'm going through the thing, everyone think of at least one good question. All right? And help me out a little here. So the presentation is called The Genesis of Two Generals. Like I said, it's just about how the book came to be. This is my grandfather here. Like I said, the book is, and sorry for those of you who I'm standing in your way. Um, so this is as I knew him, right? As an older man. Okay, this picture was taken in about the early 90s or so. But this is him in 1943. Okay? 1943, he was about 30 years old. Uh, he was a young lieutenant and platoon commander with the Highland Light Infantry of Canada out of Cambridge, Ontario. Now, my grandfather had a best friend, Jack Chrysler. He was actually the best man at my grandfather's wedding. This is my grandfather here, my grandmother in the white dress, of course. Uh, and that's Jack there on the right. Like I said, he was my grandfather's best friend. He was also a lieutenant and platoon commander with the Highland Light Infantry of Canada. And they shipped out overseas together in March 1943, okay, to go and train for the war. This is my favorite picture of the two of them. It's, uh, it's of the two of them in England during their training, okay. They were in a Highland regiment, so they got the kilts on. That's kind of as dressy as you get in the Highland regiment when you're, you know, getting all gussied up. They're, they're going out 
for something here, some kind of dinner or banquet or something fancy. But yeah, the kilts come out when you know that's the fanciest dress uh, for a Highland regiment. On the back of it, on the back of this photo, my grandfather had written at the time just an informal shot of the two generals. Like I said, it's a little joke. They were junior officers, like a couple of lieutenants, but you know when they were all you know gussied up in the kilts and whatnot, they sort of fancied themselves a pair of generals. So it's just a little offhand remark. But of course, it ended up being the title of my book, which is you know about the two of them and their friendship. The uh, the printing at the bottom of the photograph is my grandmother's from after the war. And like a lot of people in her generation, she would religiously write names and dates on the back of photographs. And we always used to make fun of her about it. Uh, but when it came time to research this book, I was thrilled any time I would turn over a photograph and find any kind of information written on the back of it. So, you know, my advice to all of you, you know, and I know we're not, you know, a lot of us don't actually print our photographs anymore. We, you know, put them up online or whatever we do, but, uh, you know, Tag your pictures in Facebook, uh, wherever you're putting your stuff online, put the names of people, you know, uh, and, and what you were doing and where it was and the date. Uh, because, you know, you never know, in 60 years somebody might be writing a book about you, you know, and if so, historians of the future would die to know who that person beside you in the photograph is, you know. Definitely, definitely, I take back all the times I made fun of my grandmother about that because it's, yeah, future historians will thank you. So the High Light Infantry of Canada went in uh, on D-Day, okay? And I don't know how much you guys have studied or not studied about the Second World War at your age. Um, I assume people sort of know D-Day, at least for movies or, you know, general talking about the war, but it, it was an enormous turning point in the war, anyway. It was when the Allies, you know, the Americans, the British, the Canadians, uh, invaded the mainland of Europe to try to push the Germans back into Germany, because they had taken over, you know, most of Europe at that point. Um, so yeah, like I say, big turning point in the Second World War. You know, uh, just a massive, massive attack. This is, uh, this is actually a photograph of the Highland Light Infantry landing on the Canadian beach, which was Juneau Beach, on D-Day, June 6, 1944. Uh, we can tell it's one of the Canadian regiments because they've got these little bicycles. You can see a guy down here in the corner walking his through the water. There's another one, another guy here handing one over the side of the boat to another guy. Um, the idea was the assault. My grandfather and his regiment were in the first wave of the attack, but they weren't one of the assault forces. The assault forces are the guys in the movies you see running up the beach, you know, and those guys were killed in huge numbers. Uh, so I'm, you know, I'm glad my grandfather wasn't one of them. Um, but the idea was the regiments that were in support, like my grandfather's regiment, would hit the beach, get on these flimsy bicycles, and the whole idea is kind of absurd to us today, and you know, I'm sure it was absurd back then, and they would ride inland and start taking over towns. It didn't work that way at all, of course. You know, these things never go as you plan them, especially in the military. But uh, that was the idea behind the bicycles anyway. So the Highland Light Infantry, because they were in support, didn't have too rough a time of it on D-Day. I mean, it's, it's not right to say anyone had a good time that day, because, you know, a whole lot of people were killed. But the Highland Light Infantry only lost one man on D-Day, which, you know, compared to other regiments, is, you know, not that bad. Uh, they did have a much harder time of it about a month later in a small French town called Buron which was the site of a horrible battle, which was absolutely devastating for the Highland Light Infantry of Canada. Uh, my book deals a lot with the Battle of Huron. It's actually the big climax of the book, is, is the Battle of Huron. During my research, I was able to find a bunch of pictures taken before the battle. I found a bunch of pictures taken after the battle. This is the only picture I was able ever to find taken during the battle. And this is of a Canadian messenger. You can see he's got the bags and stuff and the motorcycle parked behind him, taking cover behind a tree. And the more you learn about this battle, the more you learn that he was correct to be hiding behind a tree. Uh, just an alarming number of Canadian soldiers were killed in this battle. I said I had pictures from after the battle. This is some French villagers returning to the village of Buron after the battle. As you can see, they're not going to find much left. 
There actually wasn't a single building left standing after this battle. Here's another picture from after. This one really tells a story. I said my grandfather was a platoon commander. Platoon is generally 36 men, okay? He led 36 men into the Battle of Buran. This is what was left after, okay? 15 men in this photo. Two of them aren't, actually aren't even my grandfather's men. They're two other guys who just happened to get in the picture who were there. So 13, 13 out of 36 is what was left after one morning of fighting in this town. Uh, again, handwritten notes on the back of the photo. My grandfather made note of the fact that of the 13 men that were his, five were killed in the rest of the war, five were wounded during the rest of the war, and two suffered from battle exhaustion, which we now call you know, shell shock or post-traumatic stress. And they were just unable mentally to continue fighting and had to be, had to be removed. Um, so yeah, that, that's a pretty dramatic uh, you know, picture to look at when you know, when you know how many guys you know, started out. Thank you.